So if we think about why enterprise design thinking and how I come into this equation, I'm an enterprise design thinking coach and I've been uh, using design thinking as, uh, as a tool to interact with my clients and since I think uh, 2014 when this started. And enterprise design thinking really isn't a new concept. Um, it's a new concept applied to software development and, 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 and using it as a tool to elevate the human experience in product development. But if you think about it and you research the enterprise design thinking topic, you'll find references to design thinking from Stanford already somewhere around uh, the late 70s or early 80s. Right. So if we think about the world that we, we live in today, the world that we live in today looks very different than the world we used to live in. And by today, we're looking at somewhere around 30 billion devices that are connected with just 7.8 or 7.5 billion people globally on the planet. So uh, devices, I think anyone around uh, in this meeting right now is looking at anywhere around two devices. At least. So I'm uh, just looking around me, I can see my phone, I can see my laptop, and I can see my smartwatch. And with this explosion of data, the way we develop needs to change. And the human experience needs to come further into the, into, into, into the center. So we're looking at somewhere around 44 trillion gigabytes of information that we're creating on an annual basis. And even a cow today is transmitting somewhere around 200 megabytes a year. No one said it better than the uh, former CEO of Google, Eric Schmidt, who said that there were five exabytes of information cre created between the dawn of civilization until 2008. So if we think about all of the, uh, the Aztecs, the, the, the ancient Egyptians, um, the, um, the, 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 the great stories that we hear around the world, all of the different religions, you can all put them together in, in five exabytes of information. But now that much is information is created every second day. And that is something that, if, if that doesn't tell you that the world you live in isn't the world we used to live in, um, I don't know what will. And 90% of that information actually has been created in the past two years. Now, if we look at this picture, this picture tells us that there's a coffee machine, right? And probably in this picture, you see that you know, there's a functional coffee, you know, it maybe looks like a good coffee machine, maybe it looks like good design. It's a clean prototype of how this could work, how a coffee machine could work, right? But I would have to explain to you that this is a really tasty coffee, that this is, you know, this is something that is of good quality because Nespresso created it. Um, but assume that I'm putting this picture in front of you. I wouldn't have to say anything more than just showing you this picture for you to, to assume that this lady is having a nice cup of coffee. So showing is better than telling, but feeling is even better than showing. Thinking about today's world, your last best experience that you have anywhere becomes the minimum requirement for your experience, for your next experience. And here I think about a time where electronic tickets started to be created. And um, there was one airline at the time, it was called Ryanair, and they, they were the first ones to use e-tickets in, in, in the trip from London to Germany that I used to make on a, on a regular basis. So then when I booked with Lufthansa, I was surprised. Why do, you not, why do you not have electronic tickets? If we think about a more, a, a more recent example, I use Emirates NBD as a, as a bank, and I use um, um, what is now called uh, First Abu Dhabi Bank. The app of Emirates NBD is, you know, um, I'm not sure if I'm on record or not, but I, as a user, I, I, I like using the app of Emirates NBD much better. So I, as soon as I log in off that app and I use any other app, that app of Emirates NBD becomes my benchmark. So, the users that we're dealing with, the people that we're dealing with, they're demanding that better experience. And we are not in a situation anymore where, okay, I'm in the healthcare industry, therefore I'm just comparing myself to the healthcare industry. No, we're in the experience industry. 
anyone that is using any form of technology is going through a certain experience and people want to have a positive experience. Therefore, whatever best experience they had, they start thinking about, hey, but why isn't this guy doing it in a similar fashion? Here, I want to pause for a second. I want to try something. I want to try and show you a video of, uh, of, of Steve Jobs talking about design. Um, but videos in uh, meetings is always a different thing. So in case you can't hear the video, um, if someone can quickly tell me that uh, they can't, um, this is a two-minute video I'm going to start playing now. Design's a really loaded word. If I can just quickly hear back, uh, are you able to hear the video? Are you able to uh, did you hear Steve Jobs speaking? I can hear it very well from my end. I don't know. If All right, okay, so let's watch this video. I don't know what it means. And so we don't really talk about design a lot around here. We actually just talk about how things work. Um, most people think it's how they look, but it's not really how they look, it's how they work. I think Steve is a design champion by action, not by talking about design. It's that he's a collaborator, that he really understands design, um, not academically, but as a participant. Steve not only is a champion of design, but creates an environment for designers that's conducive to producing terrific work. Everyone says, you know, I want to make a great product or I want to make a great movie or whatever they're doing. Uh, so there's no difference there, but there's a big difference in the outcomes. When we were developing the new iMac, we were at a point when we had a, a couple of solutions that, I mean, at the time, I think we, yeah, we thought they were good. But we had that sinking feeling, you know, when you start to, you, you, you are aware that you're trying to convince yourself something's actually better than in your heart, you really know that it is. Sometimes you just have to look at yourself and go, you know, it's just not really great. It's okay. It's good. But let's not fool ourselves and call it great. Steve really felt that we could do better and we, we all realized we needed to. I mean, that's a hard, hard call to make. You know, we're willing to throw something away because it's not great and try again when all of the pressures of commerce and uh, are at your back saying, no, you can't do that. Steve is so much more than a supporter of design. He not only has a very clear sort of sense of vision and sense of the future, but has this sort of um, unnerving ability to describe the future in a way that's very inclusive, in a way that draws people from many different disciplines sort of in to share the sense of what this vision could be. All right. So here we saw Steve Jobs um, talking to us about, about the principles that we're going to be learning about in design thinking. Right, and we heard we heard things that he said where he said we we weren't afraid to throw it away, you know, we weren't afraid to start from scratch. We heard his colleague talk to him uh, talk to us about how he creates an inclusive environment and how he puts the human experience at the center of it. And enterprise design thinking as a methodology really allows you to 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 do that in a structured manner. You start with understanding and developing the empathy for the person that you're developing for. You then go into exploring the process of potential solutions. Right? And here, I think, is probably the, one of the, 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 the biggest mind shifts from, from traditional methodologies to design thinking. Because design thinking doesn't start with what is the problem. It starts with what is the user's experience? What are they looking at right now? How are they performing the task that we're looking to, to en en enhance for them? How are they performing it today? Next, it starts creating prototypes. And when, I, when we talk about prototypes, they're not sophisticated prototypes. We're going to look at uh, um, how to create prototypes. And you know, a good drawing might just be a good prototype. Right? So it doesn't need to be something that's clickable. And throughout this process, you're constantly evaluating. Right? So you're understanding what the user is doing, and then you're evaluating if you understood it correctly. You explore how to improve it, and then you evaluate if you 
going along the same line. You're prototyping on paper or in a, in a low fidelity design point of view, and you, you go back to the user. And that, that concept is called the concept of playback. So you understand any playback, you explore any playback, you prototype any playback. Funny the point on prototypes, it's actually been proven that, um, that, that when in focus groups, people will be much more willing to provide feedback on a prototype that doesn't look sophisticated than on a prototype that looks very sophisticated and, and has been developed uh, and through, through uh, an extensive process. Because think about it, if I'm looking at a prototype that is maybe a drawing on a paper, then I'm, I'm thinking that, you know, the guy probably invested 10 to 15, maybe an hour, uh, 10 to 15 minutes or an hour to create this prototype. So whatever comments I give him, he will not have to rework them a lot. But if you're thinking about me developing a, a sophisticated, well-designed prototype that I then go to a user, they might actually be hesitant to provide you with that honest feedback. Right? So we're going to look at the principles of, of design thinking. We're going to explore the loop and we're going to look at it. So we, we touched on this briefly earlier. Showing is better than telling, right? I showed you this coffee machine that had clear instructions or so say it, it, it was clear that this is a coffee machine that creates a, a good cup of coffee. But when I showed you a picture of a woman actually enjoying this coffee, you could feel much better that you know, someone that's enjoying this cup of coffee. And you know, probably I want a cup of coffee myself right now because I saw that picture. So the first lesson that we want to walk away with is we need to focus on the human need. When we're focusing on the human need, we generally generate better ideas, right? Think about it this way. If I'm currently facing an issue with um, how, let's stick with the coffee, of how I'm preparing my, my cup of coffee and my cup of coffee is, is, is not a good cup of coffee. If someone comes to me and provides me with a better way to create a cup of coffee, that actually focuses on my requirement. The next lesson is the lesson of, of transparency and openness, right? Many perspectives generate more possibilities. So rather than, than you being a development team right now, and, and I'm not sure how, how the, the, um, the teams are set up right now, but I'm assuming there's maybe two to three people in a team, maybe five to six people in a team. But even that is a limited number of people. Open it up, start speaking to people around you, start speaking about it to people that actually have, are facing the issues that you're trying to solve. And when you're opening yourself up to more perspectives, you open yourself up to the ability to create more possibilities. Steve Jobs referred to it in the video and design thinking practices of as a methodology. Sometimes the best way to learn is to actually make a mistake. But we wouldn't want to make mistakes after we've invested hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars in product development. We want to make mistakes very early on, where we're creating these, these low fidelity prototypes to actually gain feedback on them. If we now look at our key principles in design, I've said this probably over and over again since we started, but if you don't take away anything, then please take away that. Make users your North Star. In the end, you're creating something that is supposed to solve something for someone. If you're creating it in isolation from this someone, then, you know, God knows maybe you are going to be successful, but your chances of success are going to increase when you focus on the user outcome and you focus on why you're doing this for the user. Include a user in, in your thought process, right? Think about how you can even now in this hackathon, start including people that will use the solution that you're putting out there. Right? And measure the success, not based on great functionality or great design, but measure the success based on what benefit you're bringing to the user. How easy is the user's life after he starts using your solution? How difficult was his life before? 
in the end, you succeed, so you, you success, your success or your failure will not be an individual success or failure. You succeed or fail as a team. And you're collaborating as a unit and you have empathy for each other. And I think having empathy for each other has never been more important than the time we are in today. Creating empathy for a person that, for example, is sitting at home and has their, their, people, their, their children returning to school, you know, keep in mind that there are different parts of your team, different people in your team, and different users that you're, you, need to, you need to take into consideration and respect them all across. If you succeed, you succeed as a team. If you fail, you fail as a team. One thing that is probably um, equally important to, uh, to, to points we've made earlier is this bias towards action. And when we talk about bias towards action, we already referred to these principles. And, and again, who better to state it than, than Steve Jobs, who, um, who, um, who, whose success we can still see ripple through time today. Create, ideate, have a bias towards action. Anything is better than sitting there and discussing a, a, an issue to bits. Create it the first time, let it fail. Create it the second time, let it succeed. Have a bias towards action. I'm not sure about the participants here on the call, but I've been in the professional life, God knows now, 15, 16 years, and I don't think I've ever been completely satisfied with what I delivered at one point, right? So keep in mind that there's always room for improvement, uh, but have a, have, a, have, a, have a bias towards action and don't be, don't be scared to relentlessly reinvent. If we think about the loop, the loop ties into the key piece. The first thing that you do is you observe, right? You understand what the person is doing today. You reflect on what they're doing and how they're doing. And last but not least, you actually make. And when you make, you, again, you don't need to make a, a, a high fidelity prototype, anything that can, can pass on the message of your functionality that you're looking to bring is going to be positive. Right, so let's start with the first part of the design thinking methodology, how and how you can put it to practice. How am I doing on time? Okay, half an hour, that's good. So the first thing that you do is you observe. You observe what your users are doing. How do you do that? You create something called an empathy map, right? And in that empathy map, Actually, even before you create an empathy map, you define who is that user that you're working with. Who is the person that needs to needs to deal with the challenge that you're that you're that, yeah, that you're trying to solve, right? And give them a name, give them a face, right? Say that there's there's Sarah. Sarah is 22 years old. She just started her job. You know, think about this person in absence of a real person. Maybe you have a real person that you start including in your process. But in absence of a real person, define who this person is. Who is Sarah? What does she do? How old is she? What kind of technology does she use? And put Sarah at the center of what you're trying to do, even before you try even solving the problem. And then you create empathy. And what does that mean in design thinking terms? It, it means think about the process or the day-to-day -day life of Sarah and think about what does she say? Does she say she's, um, she's, she's unable to send money back to her family? Um, does she say that she's unable to save right now? Uh, does she feel insecure in her job? Does she think that if she saves more, she can be more successful? And what is it that she does, right? So you draw this out in front of you. And I know that the, the majority of you are, are working as digital teams. And you can, you can just use a whiteboard, use paint and start drawing this out. There are obviously more sophisticated tool, uh, tools such as Muralee, um, which you can sign up for a 30 day, uh, for, for a free trial for 30 days um, and, and start using it and they, have, they come with it. So you name the user, you, you ideate about what it is that you can solve for them and how it is that you're going to solve it for them. And you're going to think about what do they say, what do they think, what do they feel, and what do they do. 
And this may seem like a, a very soft approach to things. And um, if, if this is the first time you're hearing about design thinking, mind you, the first time I heard about it, I was like, uh, why, why should we do that? But the power of it is that you're going to start understanding who you're creating the solution for, even before you start thinking about the solution. Now, mind you, you've all been giving your problem statements, you've all been giving your challenges, but still take a step back, think about the person that you're trying to do this for. And it doesn't need to be one person. Maybe it's, um, it's, it's Sarah that's 21 year old, and maybe it's Ahmad that's, that's 50 years old and has two children, and maybe it's um, another person that is currently trying to, uh, to bring their idea to the market, right? So ideate and think about who it is that you're creating this problem, right? Think about what do they say or need from others? How do they express themselves, right? What are their quotes? What do they do to get something done, right? How do they value what they do? Think about what they expect from the world and what they expect as reactions, right? So that really is the first two exercises that I'd invite you to do in, 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 in your teams, right? And obviously outside of this, this session. I think if I, uh, what, I, uh, what, I, what I alluded to earlier, if you take away nothing from this session, but this one thing is that you are not your right? Um, the design lead is not your user. The manager is not your user. The person that's judging you is not your user. The guy that is going to implement it is not your user. Only your user is your user. That might sound very straightforward, but, you know, sometimes you, you when we get into the heat of, of development and, and, and one release after the next, we seem, to, we seem to neglect that the user is always at the center. Design thinking is nothing. It is a methodology, a structured way to keep your user at the center. I refer to the concept of, of playbacks, and playbacks really is when you take uh, when you take three minutes, um, two minutes, ten minutes, depending on how long it takes you to think about what you just did. So, for example, you just created that empathy map, and then you go and you play it back to each other preferably to, uh, to, to a set of sponsored users that you have as part of it. And maybe you go to your mentor and you say it back to your mentor. In lack of anyone else, go to, uh, go to someone that's sitting there in your, in your house and, and say back the idea to them. Make sure that what you're doing, what you're thinking about very early on actually makes sense. Believe it or not, um, so there, the majority of projects in IT or that have any kind of uh, relation to information technology fail because the user has not been consulted early on in the process. Why do you do that early on in the process? Because the earlier you do it, the cheaper it will be for you to fix it. So it's all about playbacks and make sure that you, you, um, you do the playback very early on in the process. Right? Now, let's look at the, the, the next step of this. We understand who the person is. We understand what they think, what they feel, what they say, what they do. We now go into the as a scenario, right? And the as a scenario is, 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 is an easy way to think, to put this user through this journey. How are they currently evolving throughout this journey, right? And you're talking about different, different aspects. Structure the user journey into something overseeable, right? Into maybe, I, I, would, I would recommend uh, to have somewhere around seven steps, maybe an upward limit of 11 steps of the user wakes up in the morning, they do this, they do that, they interact here, they interact there. And, and each one of these phases that you label, you think about what do they do in that phase? What do they think? in that phase, and what do they feel in that phase. This is slightly different than what we did before. Because before, we were trying to understand the user generally. Now, we're thinking about a particular problem statement where you're creating this user journey throughout what do they do first, what do they do second, what do they do third, what do they do fourth. And then in each one of these phases, you think about what do they, what do, they do, what do they think, and and at the end of it, obviously, you want to play that back. 
to the team, play that back to a sponsored user that you have working with you, and play that back to someone that is, uh, is, is, is in your vicinity. Right? So when you're, when you're allowing yourself to gain a deeper understanding of what users are doing, thinking, and feeling, as they are completing a key task, and you're identifying areas of improvement, that is what you call the as-is scenario. So we've understood what, um, what, what, who the user is, we understood what they, what they do, we took them on this process of, of, of how do they actually interact with the problem today, and then you start creating ideas, and only then you start creating ideas. And again, I, I, I do believe that probably the majority of you would have started already thinking about how we can, how we can um, solve a particular problem. And I'm not asking you to throw it all out of the window and start again, but make sure that you, you understand that you're, you're, you're impacting certain users and a certain user journey, and only then start figuring out what the ideas are, right? And, and big ideas, are the ideas that you identify in the in the as is journey, where in the as is journey they have certain issues, and then you need to identify ideas how you can help them solve the, solve these issues in their um, their as is journey, right? And keep in mind, um, there's a there's a difference between a feature and a big idea, right? So a big idea is something that would that would radically change how the user is doing something today, right? Don't get into the mode where you're talking about features already, right? And while you're creating those, think about how you can sketch them out, right? And because when you're presenting it back to your users, um, you want them to understand what you're talking about. So maybe this is not too relevant in the context that we're talking about today, and uh, the sketching part of it, but in case that you do this tomorrow in a wider user group, and you want to start sketching out these ideas as well as describing, right? So ideation is where you focus on your users' pain points and needs. You stay away from features and functions. And you try and stay high level and you know obey the law of, of, of physics. You know, don't uh, don't talk about how um, maybe uh, uh, maybe Sarah has a problem sending money to her family, and uh, the solution could be beaming her from one. To the other. you know, stay realistic, think of outside of the box, but stay, uh, stay realistic and available for it. And then when you have these big ideas, again, and you know, I'm, I'm repeating myself here, but it is an important part of the process that comes at the end of every exercise that you do, you play back this idea and you, you talk about how this idea resonates with whoever you create for. So, the way that you can collaborate quickly and identify a range, a range of possibilities to meet your users' needs, that is ideation. All right, so now we've ideated. Uh, so now we know who our user is. We understand what they think, what they say, what they feel, what they do. We took them on a journey of this is what they do first, this is what they do second, this is what they do third. We then saw what they do, think, feel in each one of these. Through understanding that existing user journey, we saw where things aren't working out right now. And we started ideating for solutions. We then take these ideas where we've ideated for solutions and you start assessing them on impact and feasibility, right? And when you're impacting on, on when, you're, when you're prioritizing based on impact and feasibility, you want to stick with the ones that have a high impact and are easy to, um, to, to, to deliver, right? You want to stay away from the ones that have a low impact and are very hard to deliver. You then use a voting functionality that you can do in you know, stickers or with any, any form that uh, stars or whichever way you, you create it. And, and you start voting on your ideas that you Right? So a prioritized grid will, um, of, of functionality will, will look something like this, where you're creating these ideas and you're, you're assessing them on, on feasibility and impact. All right, so we're now at the point where we understand what the idea looks like, how feasible it is. 
Now we want to talk about something that in old school consulting we refer to as a to be scenario. In in, in new world and new way of speaking, uh, we talk about storyboard, right? We talk about the to be experience and how the ideas that we're bringing to the table will enhance the to be experience. And think about how this actually falls into the into the context of, of, of the hackathon that you're doing right now. My assumption, and, and maybe I'm wrong, is that the majority of you would have already started with immediately jumping to the two experience, right? And that may be good if you already understand the as is very solidly and you understand who you're creating it for, right? But if you jump to the to be experience without addressing the key problem, the key areas of concern that your user is facing today, then you might not be able to actually uh, relate whatever solution you're bringing. Maybe you have the best solution in the world, but if you can't relate it to the problems that your users are facing today, then it's not going to be uh, it's not going to be convincing. But think about how convincing it will be if you, during your pitch, relate to how the current problem exists and how now, with the solution that you're bringing to the table, you're able to solve it and you're relating it back to, these, to the judges that you're presenting to, right? So design thinking will give you a way to story. And the way you storyboard is you're, you're thinking about the big ideas that you've had, and you think about the as is process that the person is currently following, and then you start bringing these big ideas into a story, right? Remember when we talked about the as is scenario and we spoke about how the first step, the second step, the third step, and you go through this, um, this, 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 this journey with them. Now think about how, how does the solution that you're bringing forward, these big ideas that you've prioritized, and I do understand probably you're past the big ideas already and you have started working on, on some of your solutions, but now think about how can this solution that you're bringing improve the user's experience? And again, the, the key, the key term here is the user's experience, right? And the reason why I brought um, brought uh, brought uh, what's his name uh, Steve Jobs into this is because at the time or even today, the iPhone may not be the best telephone out there from a technological point of view. But what they've done better than anyone else so far is to tie you into an experience. Right? People say, I don't want to switch my iPhone because, you know, how will I sync my, my, uh, my, my song to, um, to my iCloud? Uh, by the way, here I think it shows that I, I, don't, use, uh, that I don't use Apple much. Um, but I think what, what Apple has done better than anyone else is put the human center at the experience and puts a functionality second, right? They don't deliver the best um, processing power or they don't deliver um, the best camera, maybe in some cases, in some cases they do deliver the best camera, that said, um, they deliver the best experience to you as a user, which is why I'd assume the majority of people on the call are carrying an iPhone and I'm uh, only one in the world still using a Blackberry. Um, so how can we iterate and communicate our ideas visually for team alignment while staying focused on users? We do that using a story. And think about the storyboard and the power of the storyboard while developing your pitch deck, right? This is where, and um, if, if nothing resonated to you before, this is where it's ready to use. When you're presenting, you want to present in a way that is a story, that makes sense, that talks about a certain experience, and talks about how what you're doing today isn't good, and how what we're going to be doing tomorrow is going to be the best and greatest. Last but not least, we're going to be talking about prototypes. And prototypes, maybe in your experience today, you'll be able to connect um, to the wonderful API platform that can Galaxy provide you and actually start prototyping in real life. In absence of that, put pen to paper and start prototyping with, with what you have in front of you. You know, a screen is nothing but a frame on, on a paper, and a button is nothing but a little circle that you have, right? So start prototyping to show, to show the, the experience that you're trying to deliver. 
and use Lego, use papers, use, use pens. Uh, you, if you're ready and you can start developing these prototypes on the platform, well and good, that's great, right? But make sure that, um, that, that you start sketching and you start um, showing these ideas that, that, that are conceptual maybe and start showing them in a way that, is, that, that the user can relate to, right? And, and this is really how, um, when we're creating a low fidelity prototype, I mentioned the study um, where low fidelity prototypes are actually better for customer feedback. Um, low fidelity prototyping is, is what gets, gets the message across, right? And here's where you can start iterating because if nothing, then design thinking is an agile methodology, right? It allows you to constantly improve. It allows you to constantly go back to the beginning and iterate on what you're creating. Right, so you can test ideas, validate concepts, and build empathies on, on prototypes. I said it before, I say it again. If you don't take anything away from this session, then please do take away that you are not whatever problems you're trying to solve are, are not necessarily problems that you're facing today. Maybe one of the challenges is about saving and you're sitting on a beautiful portfolio of stocks and cryptocurrency and property. But if you put your user in the center and you think about this, this young guy that just came to Dubai and starting his, his, his life as a 21 year old and he needs to start thinking about the future and the saving plan of the future, then you're starting to resonate to the challenge that, that you're dealing with. Right, I'm actually surprised with myself because um, this normally takes me anywhere around, uh, around four hours to three days. Um, last but not least, I want to uh, point you to the, um, to, the, uh, to, the, to the website and where you can start actually um, signing up for your, uh, for your for your design thinking badge, because you know this is also a great way to show the world that you're thinking along the line. Thinking. So um, you go to it's, it's as simple as ibm.com slash design slash thinking. Right. This is not a paid course, right? This is a course that is free of charge that you can start doing. You log in. You don't have an account. You create an account. It's a, a, a two-hour learning journey. Uh, where you hear some of the concepts that, that we, we already discussed. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's quite interactive uh, of course. It's, 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 it's not just because I'm IBM and I'm, I'm probably bound to say that, but no, it's, it's actually a, a really good course that allows you to, um, to start putting these concepts into play. And it actually provides you with the necessary templates in case you need them. 